Hi, this is Michael Dermer from The Lonely Entrepreneur, and I'm super excited to be with you here today on behalf of World Woman Foundation for a really interesting and exciting panel on reimagining women's leadership for the global reset. You know, we sit now in unprecedented times and, you know, World Woman Foundation spends a good amount of its time and effort um, working to unlock the talents of women worldwide. And now more than ever, um, leadership uh, is on everyone's mind. Uh, obviously, we're dealing with uh, crises and situations that we hadn't dealt with uh, probably before in our lifetimes and hopefully never will again. And, you know, the role that leadership plays and the role that women play uh, in crafting that leadership is a lot of what we're going to cover today. And I'm super excited to have the two guests with me that really come from different spectrums. Um, you're going to hear from Lucy, who will I'll give the opportunity for to introduce herself, has spent her career in, in Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies. Uh, we're going to talk about leadership in the context of that. And Jennifer, uh, who has spent her career uh, in and around the media and public relations world. Um, so without further ado, I would love to have the opportunity to let these two terrific ladies uh, first tell them a little bit about themselves and then uh, we'll have the opportunity to talk a little bit some of the leadership topics that I think uh, will be very interesting to everyone. So Lucy, please uh, kick us off. Thanks, Michael. Um, pleasure to be able to speak today. Um, Lucy Duncan, I'm located in Arkansas currently, and I work at the Walmart headquarters where I have um, the great joy and pleasure of working with high potential leaders as they uncover their true talents and potential. Thank you. I'm Jennifer Buonantoni, and I live here in Los Angeles, and I run an entertainment media company called Press Pass LA and a PR firm called PPLA, and uh, work with a lot of startups, all the way from startups to big companies, so all different types of leaders. Thank you, ladies. Um, so we're coming to you from LA, Arkansas, and New York, or Bermuda Triangle, if you will. Um, I think what's super interesting about um, the backgrounds of, of Lucy and Jennifer is they're just so different. So I think exploring that and getting a little bit of a different foundation or, or a foundation from each of them would be really helpful. Lucy, can you just share a little bit about the kind of evolution of your career and where you've spent your time, um, you know, both prior to and, and during your time at Walmart? Sure. Um, my first job out of college was with the largest technology company in the world. I spent seven years there, kind of beginning in very small sales and working my way up. And as more people joined our team, I recognized that I was really passionate about um, training and facilitation. And it was always sort of on the back burner, not something that I could really um, bulldoze my way into and find that right position. And um, ended up doing a lot of tech work, a lot of scrum and agile. And that's what brought me to Walmart technology. Shortly after joining Walmart, um, I went through a reorg and was on an initiative where I was like, man, this is not what I relocated my family to do, and I was not finding joy in it. So I really purposely, intentionally sought out mentors that were in the training facilitation space, and with their help, I was able to join a facilitation team where we worked um, speaking with individual contributors all the way up to officers of the company, speaking about leadership and what leadership looks like. and we, our goal was that everyone had the same definition of what leadership looks like and what leadership should be. Um, I had the opportunity to do it internationally and it was just, it was so fulfilling to get to see how much the company was investing in its leaders. And um, I also through that really became passionate about coaching. Um, we spent about four hours in the class dedicated to it, teaching leaders how to be more coach-like, you know, don't jump in to give advice, try to really push the boundaries and ask additional questions. And I thought there's so much potential for us to do more with this. And so I started working on my professional coaching certification through the International Coach Federation. And um, just as I was completing that, I joined a team that specifically focuses on creating development programs for high potential leaders. And um, that's where I sit today. And my program that I run is focused on creating a diverse pipeline. And when we were looking at the candidates that we wanted to add to the program, we specifically set our goals from the beginning. We want 60% women and we want 40% people of color. So we truly are helping develop a diverse pipeline for the future. 
Lucy, you mentioned, you know, having a common definition of leadership. And I think um, so many people conceptually uh, have different notions of what it is. Um, mm -hmm. I remember somebody said to us back in the day, you know, leadership is what you do and no one's watching, right? And, but yet there's tons and tons and tons of these definitions. Can you tell us a little bit about how maybe you personally, or maybe more specifically Walmart defines leadership? Well, um, I don't want to take up the whole hour, but I will try to. <laughs> um, a lot of it is, is situational. You know, um, you mentioned that leadership is what we do when people aren't watching. And I, and I would define that as integrity. Um, but you also have to be empathetic and you also have to hold people accountable. And you also have to set an example so that people are actually willing to follow you and so that they trust you. And part of that is establishing credibility. Part of it is being reliable. Part of it is being vulnerable. Um, and as you sort of teed up this conversation talking about how we're really in unprecedented times and we're leading through unprecedented crises, we need people that um, are going to clear the rubble of these old ideologies and mindsets while tending to those that have been broken and damaged by them. And we need people that will uncover voices and gifts that respond to these crises that are occurring now. Uh, what's so interesting about the backgrounds of the two ladies that you're having an opportunity to hear from today is because they are so different, um, I think we're going to get different perspectives. But just to take up on some of the things that Lucy mentioned, um, you know, I come, as many of you know, from the entrepreneurial world. Uh, and in the context of the entrepreneurial world, there's all these different things that come at you at the same time. And I think, Lucy, as you described, um, I remember one time saying to someone, you know, when you walk into a bookstore or go to Amazon, there isn't one book about being a CEO, right? Um, and it is, and I'll use this as a, a continuum of capabilities that you have to learn to deploy what arrow out of your quiver at what time, what button on the blender to press, um, and how to have judgment. And um, as we hear a little bit more from Jennifer in a minute, who comes more from an entrepreneurial space that she'll share, um, that's really the topic I want to be able to explore because I think a lot of the times we think that, oh, um, we will just hear from somebody and they will tell us the key to leadership is you do this at Tuesday at 10 a.m. and you say this when you walk into a meeting and this is how you dress and this is the tone you use. Um, uh, and that's just not the way it works. So want to explore this whole idea of a continuum in a minute. So um, Jennifer, you obviously come from a very different place. Um, in fact, have you ever spent time in corporate America? No, I haven't. <laughs> I mean, not really, mostly startups. Um, I have, like, as we talked about yesterday, I have a pretty different background and I started uh, my career coming out here um, and I was pursuing writing and, and comedy acting and stand-up comedy and I'd gone to school for screenwriting and production and I ended up falling into TV and film uh, first reality uh, TV on The Apprentice actually with Donald Trump and that was one of my first jobs out of school and then uh, into scripted TV for about seven or eight years then I worked in talent management uh, then I worked in film development then I worked in in digital marketing and NPR so it's been like a very interesting transition for me but one of the things that is consistent is I actually worked uh, almost solely for females in my entire 17 year career. I haven't had, I actually haven't had a single male boss. Um, so it's been interesting to learn from other women, some good and some, you know, who I thought could have improved perhaps, uh, but just how they help other women kind of come up and kind of take their place, especially in a very uh, male dominated industry, such as entertainment and, and, and media. Um, and so that's been really interesting, you know, and in terms of leadership and defining leadership for myself, uh, you know, becoming, starting my own website about 10 years ago and then starting my own PR firm about three years ago where I actually had, you know, a full staff of employees. I think it's a learning curve. I think it's a, a lot of it is about flexibility and being able to admit like when you're wrong and say, hey, perhaps I didn't handle this as best I could and I'm gonna handle it better next time. Um, and transparency. I'm very transparent with everyone on my team, especially what we've been going through uh, during the pandemic was a very scary time for everyone with jobs and the company and just really keeping everyone, you know, as open as I can with, hey, this is the situation. This is what we need to succeed 
and to stay, you know, to stay afloat even. And this is a uh, kind of cooperation we need as a team to keep things going. Yeah. So think about even in the context of, of obviously the two of you that come from very different places. Um, you know, if we walked into, if we could walk into a Starbucks and someone asked us out leadership, they would get uh, not completely different uh, definitions, but certainly a, a range of, of characteristics and perspectives uh, that, uh, that can be oftentimes aligning and oftentimes confusing. And so, um, you know, Jennifer, for you, um, when you, I know you worked for others for a period of time, but then you made the leap to start your own company, right? Um, and, and in the lonely entrepreneur world, we always like to say when you have founders, um, like it or not, you're the CEO, yeah. right? Because many times you're a technologist or a fashionista or a clinical professional and you say, hey, I'm going to develop this thing. And then all of a sudden they put CEO on your desk. Um, tell us a little bit about your transition to not only, you know, delivering your service, but also um, did you think about leadership? How did you think about it? Or is it something that was just kind of you realized that was on now on your business card and you had to actually had to address appropriately. Yeah, I think um, for both parts of my company, it was almost, it was almost not a conscious decision to start it, but it, but at the same time it was, it was like building in me for a long time. But then when it happened, it was like, Oh, I've, I've done this, you know? So for example, with the entertainment side, I had been working for some bigger publications like us weekly and other publications and doing red carpets and, and doing reporting and, and I just felt, I mean, there was one day I was on the red carpet, it was pouring rain, I was out there, I was soaking wet, it was me and my camera guy. And I just remember thinking, I feel like I can do this better, not better than these big companies, but better in terms of the types of content I wanted to see. Um, and it just like became a conversation in the pouring rain about why don't we start, uh, you know, I'm going to start my own website, I'm just going to do it. I just like made the decision. And then there was a big learning curve, like I knew nothing about even building a website. How do I source the content? How do I um you know build out a staff and so a lot of it became the leadership became about my passion for the mission behind it and i think my honesty in recruiting people to say hey come come work with me we're going to build this out um, and similarly with the agency route i was working for other agencies while i was running the website uh, and then i just sort of realized after you know a few years that it didn't make sense that why wouldn't i just have my own agency tied to the entertainment platform uh, and, you know, I got a couple freelance clients and I made the decision to leave and go on my own. And then uh, somebody I'd worked with at a different agency said they were leaving, wanted to know if they could come work with me. I hadn't really thought about it up to that point. And I was like, you know, this could be good. I have enough business. We could do the two of us. And within a year, there were six of us and then we had an office and it just sort of happened. But then you do have to address it. You're like, okay, there's all this stuff you don't know and no one has maybe taught you just simple things like onboarding, you know, having a handbook, onboarding new employees, putting people on payroll, you know, setting up your licensing, setting up the taxes, having a lawyer draft your contracts. There's all this stuff and it can be really overwhelming and you kind of feel like you're out there on your own, but there are some good entrepreneur groups out there getting advice from other people. You know, my, my dad worked in business for years and was a great, you know, mentor to me. Um, I always say he's the employee of the month that doesn't get paid, <laughs> but uh, I always ask him for advice and, and it's just sort of building it out. But I would say with leadership, I, I tried to take the best of what I'd seen from other bosses and, you know, use that and leave behind the things that I didn't like when I was an employee and then just be honest with my team and, and just tell them, you know, what the plan is, where we're coming from and take, take their feedback. It's, it's a group effort, effort, but at the end you make the ultimate decisions and you know, you answer for everything. So well, that's it's, it. in, it's interesting because as most of you know, with Lonely Entrepreneur, I'm intimately involved and my organization's intimately involved with people going through those journeys. Yeah. And Lucy, it's almost comical to say we don't have employee handbooks and we don't have process. <laughs> and because obviously you're at a place like Walmart um, that probably has that, that stuff in droves. And, and Jennifer, as you describe it, when we think about this whole idea of this kind of global reset, you know, you were doing it in the context of you have passion, the industry is evolving, you know, certainly a couple of years ago and, and now, you know, even pre-COVID um, in dramatic ways uh, in the way that content was served up. But as you describe it, you have all these other things that you need to be able to do. 
right? And then you say, and oh, by the way, I've got a lead, yeah. right? And, yeah. and I think all of us start to realize that sometimes that's backwards, right? Is that the, that the leadership part of it and how you kind of lead, whether it's customers or employees or investors or whatever it is, become these core characteristics. And, and I want to take up on that a little bit, Lucy, with you. Um, where did the impetus um, from Walmart come from in recognizing the importance of it? Was it an event, a leader, an initiative? Um, how did Walmart, you know, uh, say, we've really got to teach this because it sounds like it's a very committed and systematic way now that it's being unlocked through the programs that you're running. Um, where did that initially come from at Walmart? Well, there are two things that Jen said that I think completely resonate and um, and I certainly see them within larger companies as well is that uh, it isn't something that just came to me overnight, but it built, it built within. And there are so many companies where um, training or leadership development is just, it's not a priority. Um, and, and that was one of the main reasons that, that I left my, the company that I was with prior to Walmart was that training and development and continuously learning is something that's so important to me. And so why would I stay at a company that doesn't make it a priority for them? And it's something that we, what Walmart truly over indexes on because it's one of, it, it's the largest employer within the United States outside of the U.S. government. And if we want to be able to serve communities, I mean, even again, I, I hate to continue to refer to the pandemic, but it is our reality. Um, it's one of the few places where people have been able to go and get the needs that, that they have, right? Um, the, yeah. the equipment to keep us safe, the food for our tables, and continuously trying to adapt and to provide for our communities. And you have to be able to lead in order to do that. And leadership doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's, it's a social concept. Um, it's something else that Jen was talking about is that, yes, it builds within me. And then I have to have other people to help guide, whether that's I'm gleaning, leaning, um, excuse me, learnings of things that I definitely don't want to do or things that I do want to do. And then you continue to learn as, like you said, Jen, being transparent with your associates and getting feedback from them. And it's, it's a continuous learning process. Yeah, I'm, su I'm sure. Um, when you think about, you know, the programs that you've put in place, you know, mm -hmm. and, and enhanced, um, you know, kind of in Walmart, you think about you know this you know this idea of a continuum or the idea of what I'd like to explore a little bit, which is which is judgment, right? There isn't just a formula for all this, right. and I have a, a couple of topics that I'd like to explore with both of your perspectives. You know, one of those is really around um, this whole idea of kind of innovation versus the status quo, and I think. Lucy, I'm sure you see this all the time in your history in corporate America. And we've got a way that we do things. And some of those ways are incredibly important to allow a large organization like the ones you've worked for to work and to function. And that status quo, both process and substance exists. Um, and yet you have to, for lack of a better word, innovate and change, right? And that's a very, very delicate balance when you work for public companies that have numbers to hit and at the same time worry about, you know, disruption um, as organizations like Walmart compete with, you know, Amazon and, and dot, dot, dot. Um, tell me about your own uh, thought process around, you know, how do you help leaders think about the judgment uh, and the decision making between you know, those choices between, in this particular example, the status quo versus, versus innovating. Mm -hmm. We, um, something that's been really popular in a lot of discussions around training and development and um, particularly leaders is polarity management. You know, a problem is something that you can find a solution for, you put a bandaid on it, you walk away, you never have to address it again. But a polarity is, as you've mentioned, Michael, it's two different tensions that are pulling on one another constantly. We've got one that's, um, do I stick with tradition and um, uh, keep the status quo, or do I lean into change and, and innovation? And if we over-index on one, there could be really negative impacts. So 
in a polarity, the whole idea is that I'm going to have to manage both of these tensions and I'm going to have to keep them both at bay. If I over-index on one, there are going to be some warning signs that I have to pay attention to and I'll have to take action around them. And whether you're an entrepreneur and own your own company or whether you're an you know, S&P, when you're looking at innovation, how are you going to be using innovation to help you stay up to be with your competition and the other companies out there? And if you don't, what's going to happen? You know, and, and we try to look at a lot of different business cases where um, companies have fallen to the wayside. And when we look at what happened, it's, well, they weren't paying attention to their customer. They weren't listening to the customer's needs. They weren't um, up to date on technology and all of the different opportunities that that unveils. But you still have to have that strong sense of what your true culture and your mission is. And so it's that balance of how am I going to continually bring value to my customer as the landscape retail or press or technology con continuously changes while holding fast to my mission and bringing value to my customers. You know, it's such a difficult balance, right? Because, you know, if you go back and listen to, you know, the stories of even the, the CEO of Blockbuster, literally, you know, two weeks before they filed for bankruptcy, um, you know, Blockbuster should have created Netflix, right? Mm -hmm. They had all the licensing deals and all the media and all the content, Jennifer, from your world to, you know, not press a button, but certainly press a button. And you have this, the status quo of we've got this footprint of stores all over the country, um, and are we going to kind of cannibalize our own business? And it takes real, real leadership to do that. I don't know if each of you know the story of HBO. Um, you know, HBO at the time um, was one of the few cable channels and relied heavily on boxing. So they would sign these big boxing deals. And when there'd be a big fight, like a Mike Tyson fight, they would get a bunch of subscribers to sign up. And they kept kind of recycling that formula. And the le some leadership in HBO went, um, and asked for at the time $100 million to develop an original content. And their leadership said, what? We're going to do what? We're going to develop original content. And now, obviously, the, the rest is history in terms of the, um, you know, some of the amazing early content that came from HBO. But think about the leadership that that takes, right? And, and that tug of, hey, we've been doing the same thing, right, for so long and, and in Blockbuster's case, having great success. And now leaders are going to have to um, challenge that, like understand, right, the status quo. And at the same time, tell all the people most likely that built the status quo that this isn't going to work tomorrow, <laughs> right? And, and that takes an incredible amount of a lot of the things we've talking about here, emotional intelligence, judgment, good process, right, bringing together the right information and tools. You talk about business cases. So... I think a lot of times people, you know, envision leadership of, you know, a, a, a woman executive standing in front of a hundred people and say, let's go. Right. As opposed to a series of these, as you said, Lucy skills, right. That you, and perspectives that you develop, you know, Jennifer, for you, um, obviously myself and you coming from the entrepreneurial world, we, I don't want to say we don't worry about the status quo, but certainly we are mindful of it, but are not limited by, kind of the boundaries, because that's how we think. But you were doing it in the context of an industry that very much had a status quo, right? About the way films got made and the way things were brought to bear. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, how your own perspective um, kind of struck the balance between, okay, here's the status quo. And as you said, as you were standing in the rain, right? Like there's a better way to do this. How did you go about bringing that to life in the balance between the status quo and kind of in innovating in your own way? Yeah, I think, you know, so it's interesting between status quo and innovation. And I think, um, you know, from our PR agency, we work with, like I said, we work with some companies that are publicly traded, bigger companies, and we work with some startups. And, you know, the startups always tend to be more open to innovation. And some of that is because maybe they just don't know what they what they want to do yet, or they're, they're looking for our guidance um, versus some of, you know, the bigger companies. There's a lot of I don't want to say red tape, but we, we can we might propose something that we think is really innovative, but then needs to get signed off by like 10 or 15 different people. And it's the same thing, even like with individual clients, like we work with Lifetime or Disney or, you know, the networks, they have their, um, mm -hmm. their ways of doing things. So, 
uh, you know, from my perspective, sometimes I'm jealous of those ways. I'm like, man, they have a playbook, they have everything laid out, they know what they want to do. Whereas I think being like a smaller company, we, we tackle this all the time, right? Like if I'm pitching for a new business, we're not a traditional PR firm that just does you know, kind of the archaic ways. Like we, we will also look at digital. We will also look at how marketing comes into play. We throw a ton of events and launch events for our clients. Um, so whenever I tell people, I'm like, oh, we're a non-traditional PR firm. And then there's also that balance between providing all this extra value yep. and making sure that you don't go too wide and that you can deliver and that, you know, you're being compensated properly for the amount of things that you're doing. So I think there's, there is that balance and being able to pivot too. Like for us, We've pivoted a lot. If I see, hey, this isn't working, we need to do something else. For example, with forming the entertainment side, there was no way for us to really compete with, say, like an E or even an Us Weekly who I'd work for in terms of the number of viewers and um, you know how you make money on a website through you know millions of clicks. So we pivoted with the agency as uh, you know a way to make money and as a way to also deliver better content. And I saw bigger companies like Mashable and other companies doing this, like with agencies and with advertising wings. And so it's a lot of research and staying on top of it and then figuring out what is the best for you. And sometimes you try it and it doesn't work and then you make a different decision. And that's kind of, you, you know, know. And, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of, of you know, my perspective um, that I shared with you. You know, I started the first company in the United States to reward people for being healthy and we sold to health plans. Yeah. You know, some of the most complicated organizations on the planet and to, to do, I'm sure, Lucy, you have it now at, at Walmart, right? Incentive programs to reward for healthy behavior that are now everywhere. Um, and, you know, health plans would say, uh, we are never going to reward people for being healthy. This is in the early 2000s. And, you know, you have to respect that status quo, but at the same time um, say, well, wait a minute, we've been doing the same thing for 50 years and we're not getting diabetics to do X and, and Y and Z. And so, Part of the leadership is being able to, as you said before, um, Lucy, kind of respect that dynamic, um, but at the same time, challenge it and challenge it with credibility and data um, and relationships of, that have been built that are all of these things that are that that go into a formula, um, you know, specifically around, you know, how do you make this all work and what judgment do you bring to the table? Um, I, I want to kind of explore another another continuum. Um, and specifically interested in, you know, kind of, uh, kind of a, a woman's lens on this. Um, Lucy, you and I talked about this whole idea when I asked you a little bit about, you know, what are the characteristics do you believe, you know, one of the many that women bring to the table, and, and you said empathy, and I think that's certainly the case. Um, and then you say, well, are people that are, you know, inherently empathetic, can they also strike the balance of what might other people perceive the other end of that continuum, which is uh, accountability. So Lucy, can you talk a little bit about um, this continuum of being empathetic on, on the one hand, and at the same time, if you are going to lead, if you are going to, as you do with your program, enable you know, high potential leaders, they have to own things, right? Tell me, talk to me a little bit about your perspective and, 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 and particularly a woman's perspective, you know, in terms of this balance between empathy and accountability. It, I love how you teed it up as a continuum because it, it is, it's something that we have to balance, right? And empathy at its core is, I, I care about the individual that I'm speaking to. And so bringing accountability into that conversation is, I'm speaking to you about this because I care about X, and that could be your success, your reputation, um, your progress on this initiative that you're working on. And in, in changing the lens to thinking about women or thinking about people of color, we have just old ideologies and mindsets that um, tend to really have damaged us and damaged our progress and damaged um, our place in society. And so using empathy, we can uncover those voices and those gifts and we can respond to the misogyny or the racism and every ism and every phobia there by saying, I want to talk to you about your progress or I want to talk to you. I want to give you some feedback. And my intent is because I care about you and I want to see you successful. Mm -hmm. um, is being empathetic 
contrary to holding people accountable? No, not at all, because it, holding people accountable is making sure that they get the task done. The way that you do that, the way that you approach the conversation is with empathy. I recently heard um, one of our executives, he was saying that he was really struck by, he, went, he, he was asking an associate that works in one of the stores, how are you doing? And he said, the first response was, well, our numbers are blah, 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 and he, right, right. and then he said, but how are you doing? And then the next response was, well, the team, I, I'm kind of worried about the team because the team is excited. And he let them finish and he went, I want to know how you are doing. <laughs> and what have we done to create a type of culture where we have to ask someone three times before they'll be truthful and tell you how they're really doing? Yeah. Are, are we weaving in enough empathy? Are we having conversations that say, I care about you? And if we can take care of our associates, that's all we have to do. And they're going to feel appreciated. They're going to feel valued and they're going to bring value to the customer. Um, Lucy and Jennifer, I shared with both of you that I started my career as a mergers and acquisitions lawyer. Mm -hmm. And as a young gentleman, if I had walked into a room and said uh, in New York City, much less, you know, I'm doing big deals and as a young gentleman, and if I had walked in a room and spent five or 10 minutes on how somebody was doing, um, I would have been walked out of the room, <laughs> right? And you, you take these bad leadership traits with you early on, and then what you start to realize and to frame, put a, another frame on what you said, Lucy, is um, if your job is ultimately to get a result of the people that work for you, what does it take to actually get that result? Now, we can say, I don't care at all about the person. I don't care at all about the fact that they don't have daycare at home and X and Y and Z um, and push hard to try to get a result of whatever that, you know, result for the company is. Does that, does that get the result that you want? Um, or secondly, is it this combination of being empathetic and the emotional intelligence to understand who's sitting across the table from you that actually gets the result? And as we evolve, um, I hope anyway, from, for example, my early career, on a scale one to 10, I was probably a 10, you know, New York M&A lawyer, <laughs> right? Just go, go, go and not think about that stuff. And what you realize over time is you don't actually get the result that, that you're trying to get, the business result, you know, unless you're able to not only, you know, bring empathy into the accountability discussion, but to, to know when to kind of push and pull, right? To, to say, I care about you and this is important, but we need to get this done and how do I help you do it? Um, and I think that we learn over time that, the, that it isn't a tug, that it is a continuum, but at the same time, there are different situations where you have to apply different levels of it. Um, uh, Jennifer, in, in your work, um, which is obviously in much less structured environments, you, know, you talked about those early days where you mentioned, you know, kind of off the cuff and all of a sudden I had a team, right? And all of a sudden um, I was their leader um, in an early stage company, unlike a Walmart where there's lots of process and structure, um, a lot of that doesn't exist, right? Um, you might have a daily meeting or a weekly meeting, but you don't necessarily have dashboards and accountabilities and performance managers and stuff like that. Um, how did you strike the balance between being empathetic to your folks and, and also at the same time holding them accountable in a fast moving environment? Yeah, I like what Lucy was saying too, as well about sometimes asking three times, right? Because I noticed that in the beginning too, when I would ask my employees how things were going, they would give me the client updates and I wasn't always talking about the clients, you know? Um, but to answer that, we did try to get some structure early on. Um, I used some of the structure from a previous agency that I've worked at that I really liked in terms of how we do our filing system, how we do our reporting, weekly calls, um, all that kind of stuff. So some of that was there. But like you said, it's it's different in a startup, right? I know all my employees pretty pretty well, like pretty closely. And some of the people I hired were my friends, which can overcomplicate as well, right? There were days yep. where I wish I could call an HR person to sit down and have the tough conversations that you know I knew could affect a personal relationship there. But you have to also realize like you're running a business and you're paying people to do a job and you need to get the results that you need to get, but you also have to have empathy. I think, you know, even in this last year, just with my agency, you know, I hired someone 
and then quickly found out right after they were having a baby and we had to structure how is this going to work I want to keep you you want to work and you know we figured out what would that maternity time look like I had an employee whose mom was sick we figured out how they were going to work remotely and there's been a lot of that um, and even with the pandemic now there's a lot more of just taking into account how is everyone's mental health doing how is everyone feeling um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I shared with you yesterday, actually, that um, for myself, you know, I, as an entrepreneur, you sometimes work 12, 15 hour days on average. Um, and then in March, I was actually in a really bad accident and I had a head injury and some neurological things going on. And it's only about four months and it's been really hard for me to get back up to speed. And it actually made me realize both as a leader that I had to delegate better, that I couldn't always dive in and jump in and be the last line of defense, that I needed to trust that the team I built was capable of doing things so that mm -hmm. I could start to recover. And then also I had to be honest and go to my team for empathy and say, hey, if I stare at the computer for more than three hours, I'm done. Like I have terrible migraines. Like I need you guys to step up and help me and we gotta find alternate ways to make this work so the yeah. clients don't, don't notice anything changed, right? And and we've made that work. So I think now more than ever, humanizing things is important, but also figuring out how do you have that empathy, but also still get the end results that you need to get. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously a constant continuum, right? Of, of trying to balance. Um, and so, you know, we're, we've got a little bit more time left and I wanted to kind of open up another topic uh, similar to this and another continuum, if you will, or choice, if you will. Um, and that is the, the infamous uh, ask for permission or beg for forgiveness. Uh, we are all faced in a situation where we have to kind of lead an initiative and move things forward. And as part of that leadership, whether it's our own, trying to get a result uh, or leading others in teams where we're struck, right, with this choice of going through all the proper normal channels and asking for permission, uh, knowing full well that 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 is important and respectful um, and has sometimes hoops that you have to jump through, um, uh, sometimes worth it, and but also is slower. And on the other end, end of the spectrum, uh, begging for forgiveness um, and, uh, you know, kind of moving things forward and at, at times um, leaving kind of a wake that are, that's left to be cleaned up. So, um, Jennifer, let me let me start with you. What has your your DNA been about? You know, the balance between uh, asking for permission and begging for forgiveness. It's a tough one. I think I try to find I try to find a balance in like what my own moral code is. Like, what do I feel comfortable doing this? And if someone did this to me or our company, would would I? How would I react? Kind of thing. I think you know, most of the time we ask for permission, unless it's a time sensitive thing or the opportunity is so great where it's like, I know this is gonna bring what my client needs or what my company needs and we'll deal with it later if there's any fallout, you know? So there's there's that balance. And I think, I think the longer you work with people, um, both your own team and your clients, um, there's trust there that, you know, they know that you have their best interests and they're a little more flexible to let you make decisions on their behalf, especially on the PR side where it's their reputation and their public facing, uh, you know, sometimes I have to speak on their behalf. Yep. I always try to get their feedback, but after, you know, some things need to be, hey, we need a quote right now. This is on deadline or we need a decision. And I try to make the best decision I can. And I think over time they yep. start to trust that. But sometimes, you know, there's, there's been times where you make a decision and they're not happy. And then you have to, you know, like you say, ask for forgiveness or explain what your rationale is. A lot of times if you explain where you were coming from and what your motivation was, and there is that trust there, then it's usually okay is what I found. But um, yeah, it, it's a tough one. I'm, I, I'm curious to see what Lucy says. I'm assuming with a bigger company, you can't make as many on the fly decisions um, and, and I'd love to hear it, so. Lucy? Uh, um, I, I think that a lot of it comes down to judgment. As you were saying, Jennifer, it's, it's definitely a balance. I, um, my leader is, is really well known for having shared, if you have the will, the skill, and the permission, then you have the initiative to go for it. And I think it's our job as leaders to, as you were talking about like delegation, 
we have to trust our staff when we delegate to them. And it's the same way, like we trust that whatever decision they're going to make is going to bring value to whomever the customer is, whether they're external or internal. Um, and it's, it's definitely a fine line to walk. And when there are crises, that really becomes like the mother of invention. You know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy that had to go away so that companies could respond quickly. And it's almost like we're making our own chapter um, in history and we need new ideas um, and, and see an actual potential that this new landscape can bring. And so I mm -hmm. think that I'm gonna do a cop out and say that it's, it's comes down to, it's a balance and it's your judgment. Yep. And I think also, Lucy, I, I know in our conversation yesterday, um, you know, we alluded to the credibility and trust that, you know, mm -hmm. that Jennifer just, you know, talked to and that if you have an ongoing relationship, um, then the ability to, to, to take some flyers, if you will, is more accepted. Um, that being said, many times in which you're, you're um, thinking about this balance between, you know, asking for permission, begging for forgiveness is so challenging to the status quo that it isn't like, okay, let me, everybody, everybody knows each other, everybody trusts each other and I can just go do it without fail. Sometimes you're, you're really pushing the envelope. I know, you know, in, in, in my experience, you know, we were talking to people at health plans in my old company about, you know, changing the healthcare system. And a lot of the people that were in those roles were, um, had done things the same way for a long time. And so we, we uh, kind of were going to beg for forgiveness by talking to more, you know, senior people in the company about what needed to be changed um, in terms of the way that they went to market. And so it's a really, really delicate balance. Um, I think one of the words that, that each of you use in different is also respect, right? There's a, just because you, you are, you know, begging for forgiveness doesn't mean you don't skip the respect that's not there. And you know the ability to to do it with um, the right amount of judgment and the right amount of communication um, is obviously critical. Um, one of the things that I think often is is overlooked, if you will, um, is you know that a lot of the uh, you know we 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 were kidding around yesterday that if you described you know uh, an individual that and you know, Jennifer think about your career like. An individual, they're responsible for everything. There's priorities everywhere. Everybody's coming to you for everything uh, all the time and tugging on you and you're responsible for this and this and this. You know, that sounds like an entrepreneur, but it also sounds like, Lucy, as we kidding yesterday, just a normal woman's life, right? <laughs> and, and judgment that's used every single day. And I think that the, these continuums that we talk about are continuums that, that certainly all leaders deal with all the time. Um, but, you know, women in particular, um, are, you know, thrown all of these things at the same time, asked to make many, many judgments, both personally and professionally. And sometimes the tug between those two that, you know, really allow that judgment to be honed. And, and so that kind of takes me to kind of my last kind of question around this, which is that, um, what do you think, um, and I'll start with you, Lucy, again, what do you think in terms of for a woman? Uh, and to a certain extent for, for people of color as, as you're working with the, those groups, um, how does that judgment get honed? Is it, is it pure experience or do you believe that it can be, can be taught to help female and, and leaders of colors evolve, leaders of color evolve? Tough question. I do think that experience plays a part in it. Um, you know, we started off talking about what you learn from leaders in the sense of what you want to replicate and what you don't, don't want to replicate. Um, and then as women and additionally, you know, people of color, we were talking yesterday, Michael, about how we're so prone to imposter syndrome because we grow up seeing, observing, or even being taught by our parents that you are going to have to work twice as hard as the white man sitting next to you. Yeah going to have to get better grades, you're going to have to dress nicer, you're going to need to be more articulate. And we can carry that with us into adulthood. We can carry that with us into our professionalism and into our leadership roles. And if you are the leader that people are continuously coming to and asking you questions in our heads, we're still living up to, well, this is normal because I have to work twice as hard as all of my other peers. And 
it's um it's not normal. <laughs> um, the the fact that we've been conditioned is, but we really have to be able to internalize our accomplishments and be able to say, I've earned a seat at the table for the for for a reason. I have a voice, I have gifts, and I have skills. And I have to rise to my own influence to make a positive impact. I'm not sure I answered your question at all. Well, no, I think I think that the you know, it all goes down to the, the judgment you try to teach, right? And you know, uh, having if you watch people, I, my my it happens to randomly be my mother's birthday today. She's 91 years old, and she's seen so much. She was born in 1929. You know, mm -hmm. Great Depression, World War II. The the while we age in our bodies, we gain wisdom, right? Over that time, and and the judgment that is when you see things come in, and the ability to respond to them. Um, and I just, and I have a bias that, that women, because of the balance of, of family and business and all the complexities that come are, are just, uh, create, you know, are, are always faced with so many different challenges about how to, to employ judgment, um, that over time, those capabilities really build. And especially in the context of, you know, what we're talking about here, a, a globally shifting world. Um, I think I shared with both of you my story of when my healthcare company almost collapsed in 2008. It wasn't, you know, do you walk into the street and turn left or turn right? You didn't know if the street was there. And that's the way it feels right now uh, as the world, you know, deals with this. And I think some of your comments, you know, Lucy, just about this wide continuum of things that, that women um, have developed capabilities to deal with, like, I want to say like it's no big deal because of course it is, but becomes in a lot of ways second nature. Um, if you've ever spent, you know, I happen to spend during during COVID some time with my brother and his wife and his family, and you don't have to spend more than an hour or two there to see, wow, to watch what uh, the woman of the household who also has a career and is also trying to keep everybody together and happy does in one day. Mm -hmm. And that judgment that that, you know, how do you employ that uh, when you lead others um, is obviously something that a capability that's to be, you know, admired. Um, Jennifer, what about you? And in, in obviously in a much more, much more open world and career path, um, how do you think, you know, you have or other leaders you've seen around here develop this, this judgment that we keep talking about? Yeah, I mean, like there's that saying, if you want something done, ask a busy woman, <laughs> you know, because they're the people that get stuff done. But uh, you know, for my own company, we're actually uh, right at, at this moment, all women, uh, well, we did have two guys previously. Um, and, you know, I think both, both male and female employees are great and can get, you know, a lot of great work done. I think, um, you know, there are judgments, I think, in being a woman, I've seen it myself, like there were times where, you know, we go into trying to get a bigger corporate client, say like a Walmart, and we have the deck, the deck maybe stacked against us, because, you know, we're, a younger team, we're all women, we're a mid-sized, you know, smaller to mid-sized agency, we're not a big agency. And um, even when I first started, you know, as a startup, like looking to get investors, I, um, which we ended up not doing, uh, and I bootstrapped everything, but I did investor meetings and it was interesting and I did conferences and I did the pitch, you know, live pitches on stage. Um, there were a few meetings where I actually took my dad as the VP just to see if it would change the dynamic. And it did. People would address him in the meetings and he would say, oh, Jennifer's the CEO. And they didn't know he was my dad. They just brought him as a VP just, just to see what that dynamic would be like in the room if I had like a middle-aged, you know, male figure, you know, white male figure with me versus me going in and a lot of times presenting to a room of all men a lot, of, you know, a lot of the time. And there is that, there is a little bit of that bias there. And I think, um, like you even said, for people of color, you know, that comes up again. And, you know, we have a really diverse team. I think sometimes when people meet my team, they're just shocked because we're super diverse, we're super young, and, you know, they don't know what to make of that. There can be a question of, well, can we trust these guys? Can, can they handle the job? Are they big enough to handle the job? And um, so we fight that. And then we try to fight that with just showing our experience of the types of things we've worked on and that most of us have worked, you know, I've worked almost 17 years now out here in the business, but you wouldn't maybe know it when you first meet me. So it's just, it's kind of, um, and it's a long answer. I'm getting all, all over the place, but it's, it's a tough one, right? But it's kind of just proving, you always kind of feel like you have to prove your worth and then getting to a point where you have to say like, I'm not going to 
I'm going to prove it by my, by my work, but I'm not going to sit there and, and, and go above and beyond at that point, because you have to also value like what you bring to the table. And I've seen that, that like desperation when you're early on of being like, pick us, we can do this job to now, you know, a few years in and kind of feeling like, well, look, this is what we can do for you. Here's like examples of what we've done for others. And just being a little more confident that like when you're at those tables that you belong there and that you earned it and that you can manage, manage a lot. Um, and I think also just one more thing, like before we had our own office, we were in like a co-working space, right? And there were days, you know, in the co-working, we had a private office, but there was like six of us in one room. And so if I was talking to a client or pitching a new business or anything, my whole team could hear it. And now it's not like that in our, our office now, but that was an interesting dynamic, right? Because I felt a little bit like as a leader, I need to show them what they want to see. And I can't look like I don't know what I'm doing, even if I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. And you don't, you know, you have those moments and it was a good training ground. But I remember there were some days where I would go to like the soundproof call booth and just cry for like 10 minutes. My team wouldn't know. I would just go in there and have a cry and think, oh my God, I'm, we're going to lose everything. I don't know if I'm, what I'm doing. I don't know. You know, you would never admit that normally. Right. But, but that would happen some days. And then I'd have other days where I'd go in there and be like, yes, I've got this. Like we're rocking it out. Like I know what I'm doing. And it's just kind of, I think realizing that all the leaders are like that. Even when we work with big companies, sometimes in the beginning, I was shocked at how little some of them had organization and felt confident in their decisions. And I'm thinking these guys have been around longer than us. They're much bigger than us. And it's kind of like knowing that you just make the best decision you can, you do the best you can, and you can't really look back because you don't know how it would have played out in another way, right? So you, you take that decision and then you go from there and you make the next one. And, and that's sort of my long answer to your question. <laughs> well, I think we could, the three of us could, uh, maybe with a glass of wine or bourbon could do this for hours. And <laughs> Um, such an interesting, you know, conversation around judgment and continuum. And I, and I thought I would just end on this. First of all, thank you both for your thoughtfulness and sharing some of your kind of personal journeys and experiences. You know, when you think about, you know, what we're dealing with on a global stage and not to oversimplify it, but you're literally talking about the choice between health and economy, right? As you, as you, I mean, it's not this linear, but as you dial one up, you dial the other one down. Right? If we try to be healthier, it, it, our economy suffers. And if we try to you know, revive the economy, we've seen it in many places, we've seen the, the, you know, our healthcare suffers. And it's this type of judgment and experience, right? And, and I think that there's no question that, that you know, two things that really come to mind about some of the leadership skills that in particular women uh, seem to possess around the ability to be emotionally intelligent about what's going on around, right? And to understand that the different perspectives that um, are enabling of, of leading um, and not always pressing the same button on the blender. And the second, and it sounds very mundane, which is, is priority setting, right? That, that, um, that, you know, the ability to do that, you know, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned, you know, want to get something done, find a busy woman. I mean, what do they do so well, right? They, have a hundred things they need to do, many of which affect other people in dramatic ways, children, education, right, family, not the least of which is career. Um, and, you know, if we think of the whole even topic we're here to talk about, which is in this whole kind of globally changing world beyond the normal global changes, but just the, you know, what's happening with COVID, I'm hopeful that our, you know, our audience here can take a lot away from um, number one, how difficult leadership it is, but how much it's very doable if, if we follow the leads of, of ladies like you. So thank you both for your thoughtfulness in this. Uh, and, I, and I look forward to having the opportunity in different times to get to know both of you better and hopefully the chance to, to meet face to face. So Lucy, any parting words? Oh gosh, I wasn't prepared for this. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's we're navigating through such unprecedented times. And I, I feel so cliche, like reiterating that over and over again, but we have the opportunity to write a brand new chapter in history, mm -hmm. whether it's um, expelling that, that positive energy where we do allow other people to take a seat at the table with us next to us. And are they individuals that you've never sat next to before? 
And how can that change your perspective? And how can that bring a wealth of new knowledge to the conversation and the problems that you're trying to solve? And we're not in competition with them. We're all trying to build a better world. Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of just kind of parting, I guess, wisdom, if you would say, um, you know, if you're, if you're thinking of starting your own business or, or going out on your own and, and, you know, becoming a leader, I mean, obviously there's a lot of risk, but I always say if, if it's in you, if it's calling you, you know, you have to do it, then just do it. Um, and now is an interesting time because there is no, you know, unfortunately with this pandemic, there's no real safety and security in the job market right now. There's, you know, there's no way to know. So it's like this, if you have a great job and, you, and you're going to stay there, great, but this could also be a time to, hey, start your side hustle, start building that plan out, start developing what it could be. Or if you've been laid off and there's something you've always wanted to do, I mean, yes, is it the best market to start something? No, but does that mean it can't be successful? It can be successful. So I would just say if there's something in you that you've been meaning to do or you're sitting home right now and you're like, hey, I'm tired of this Groundhog Day. What can I start doing? Start making some plans for what that might look like when things improve or what like little steps you can take now to put that in motion. Um, and that would be that would be my kind of parting, parting advice and just take a deep breath. We're all, it sounds cliche, but we are all in this year, you know, together and dealing in different ways, so. Well, thank you both. Both examples of leadership from different perspectives, you know, on behalf of World Woman Foundation, it's been an honor and a pleasure to talk with you. And I'm sure that our audience will get more than a couple of tidbits around leadership in a, in a new global world. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you for your time and great to meet you as well, Lucy. Nice to meet you.